Well, thank you, Paul. I'm going to start with a bit of a Halloween story. And good morning, everybody. Uh, it was an eerie sight in March. There was none of the usual hustle and bustle at the state capitol. It was a chilly morning. And my father, Mike Dillon, and I were being escorted up the walk to the state capitol by a CHP officer and a sergeant at arms. Well, we weren't <laughs> under arrest. Uh, we were actually headed to a hearing in the Senate Education Committee to oppose a bill that was going to cause great hardship for the public libraries. But this is what the Capitol looked like under COVID protocols, really, really eerie, both in 2020 and in 2021. We walked in the front door on the L Street side of the Capitol. We had our temperature taken by the nurse, and then they took us up uh, through security and to one of the biggest uh, hearing rooms in the Capitol, room 4203, except that when we entered, there was no one in the room that seats about 250 people, except for me, Mike, and a Republican consultant. And back in March, almost no lobbyists or members of the public were testifying in person at the state capitol. And if you did testify uh, under the COVID protocols, you had to receive special permission from the policy committee. This was such an important bill to CLA that it warranted us being there in person at the Senate Education Committee to testify through those cotton masks to ask the committee members to oppose the measure. The author, Senator Umberg, presented SB 34, which would have mandated every public library in the state to work with school districts and issue a student success library card to every uh, student. On behalf of CLA, we presented our opposition uh, behind a special plexiglass shield while the senators looked on with rapt attention. And when we were done, one by one, each senator on the committee raised serious questions regarding the bill. Well, my library can't afford this. This is a mandate. How are they gonna pay for this? What if the school district doesn't want this? This is gonna require a lot of library personnel time. Well, how did the senators on the committee know to ask such great, insightful questions? Well, thanks to you, of course. Prior to the hearing on the bill, which we'll get to in a minute in much more detail, the CLA Legislative Committee, at our request, reached out to library directors and staff in the districts of the senators on the committee. And we said, how would this bill impact you on a re in a real boots on the ground kind of way? And library directors and staff provided us with amazing information. In some cases, they either tried to implement the student success library card with some challenge, or they weren't able to because of the lack of funding and staff resources. And that my friends is advocacy at work, specifically grassroots advocacy. And it's sometimes just the smallest Thing that can make a huge difference in an advocacy effort and specifically can make a huge difference in the outcome of how we shape state laws at the Capitol. Now, if you've ever wondered about the political process, this session today is definitely for you. And if you've ever wondered if you could make a difference in the political sense, this session is definitely for you. Next slide, Paul. We'll get there right now. I need to make it full screen again. It'll just take me a second. Sorry about that. So let's get that up while I'm messing around with it. Go ahead, Christina. Perfect. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, in this over sli overview slide, today, Mike Dillon, who's been CLA's lobbyist for over 45 years, and me, Christina DeCaro, who's been CLA's lobbyist for 27 years, and then Paul Signorelli, our very capable moderator and organizer of the Ursula Myers uh, program, is going to take you through a three-part legislative 101. And we hope that this is going to be a much more colorful uh, poli sci than, than you get at your poli sci classes in college. Uh, we're going to talk about the legislative process. We're going to talk about the state budget process because it's a different animal than the legislative process how CLA develops its uh, annual legislative platform, and then how you can build relationships with your legislators. And the goal today is to leave you with some tips and tricks that will really demystify the goings on at the state capitol. So you're gonna want to participate in the process in one form or another. 
And this session starts totally from scratch. We intentionally crafted it so that everyone will benefit from the information, whether you're library staff, a seasoned library director, library trustees and friends, you name it. And periodically, Paul is going to pose questions to you as the audience. And please feel free, as he said, to use that chat box as he's going to be keeping a close eye on it during uh, the proceedings. And we'll address some of these as we go. Uh, so let's get started and let's have Mike Dillon kick us off with a primer about the California legislative process. Next slide. Thank you, Christina. Well, uh, sometimes the legislative process can be somewhat complicated, but we're going to try to simplify it today. So this section will be will explain both the legislative process and then also uh, how a bill ultimately becomes law. And we will leave this slide up for a few minutes because I'm going to give a, a little bit of background. Uh, during this uh, legislative session that just concluded in early September, uh, the 80 assembly members introduced about 1600 bills. And on the Senate side, the 40 senators introduced about 800 bills. You might say, wow, why so many? Well, and not all become law, but uh, more than half of them do. And legislators introduce bills on behalf of uh, cities or counties, or in some cases, uh, organizations like CLA. Uh, business groups, uh, labor unions, uh, Indian tribes, um, just about any organization that you can think of that's represented in Sacramento at some point has asked the legislator to carry a bill. All of the 2,400 bills um, follow the same legislative process. There are uh, 30 assembly policy committees in the assembly and 20 policy committees in the Senate. And the committees range in both houses from agriculture to education, to local government, to water, parks, and wildlife. CLA bills are often assigned to the education committee, sometimes the local government committee, and sometimes what they call double referred bills where they would be assigned to both committees. And occasionally we might have one that deals with um, your privacy, and some of those bills might go to the Judiciary Committee. Christina mentioned some of the, um, the um, information regarding SB uh, 34, and we'll get into the weeds a little bit, but first of all, when we do see a new um, bill in print as uh, with uh, SB 34, or even if we hear about a bill that's going to be introduced, almost immediately we start gathering information. We, we call the author's office and say, see, who's the sponsor of this bill? Because that can tell you an awful lot. Uh, we'll also, we'll meet with the author's staff, try to get a little bit more information there. Sometimes they don't give you as much as the sponsor of the measure will. And then we often ask the author's office, uh, you typically do a fact sheet. When do you think that fact sheet on this bill might be available so we can share it with others? And then occasionally we'll actually even go to the sponsor and say, what do you have in mind with this bill? And if it's, we think it's something that CLA might like to support, we might indicate it at that time, say it's subject to the uh, approval of our legislative committee. Or also we say, gee, we might have some problems with this bill and we're probably going to end up opposing it, but we won't know until our legislative committee um, uh, meets and considers the bill along with other bills. And then during the legislative committee meetings, the committee will decide uh, positions such as oppose in the case of SB 34 or support a measure or take uh, no position or sometimes just take a watch. So we're constantly watching the bill in case something else happens to, to it along the way. And then once CLA decides a position, for example, support or oppose, uh, we write a, a, a position letter to the author, um, dear assemblyman or senator, uh, the CLA has taken a post position or we're pleased to inform you that CLA has taken a support position. And then that letter is followed by meetings with the author's staff, uh, sometimes the author himself, if it's a very significant piece of legislation or herself. Uh, the committee consultant who writes the analysis, uh, we will meet with them and express CLA's interest in the bill. 
And sometimes uh, we might um, work with others like cities, counties, or special districts if it's a bill that might involve uh, all of those local governments and not just CLA. And then on major bills like SB 34 that Christina mentioned, we will meet with every member of the committee. We write personal notes to those members of the committee. Uh, if we can, we'll catch those members personally. And then uh, as Christina mentioned, uh, we call out the troops and, and that means you. Uh, in the case of SB 34, as Christina mentioned, every one of those committee members had something to say. And that was because of all the work that she and I had done educating members and their staff, as well as receiving uh, letters and information from the libraries in their district. That was particularly true in rural districts like Senator Dolly, who has a lot of districts up north. Uh, his libraries do not have a lot of money. And so his, his antenna went up right away and he started checking with some of his libraries and the feedback he, he got was just wonderful. If a bill fails to pass a policy committee, then um, sometimes that's kind of the, the end of our work. Um, but we always keep an eye on it just in case something might happen to the bill along the way. Sometimes a bill can be what we call resurrected and then it can take on a new life. If the bill is passed to the Appropriations Committee, the third block um, you see there, then our focus uh, shifts to the fiscal impact of the bill. Chairs of the committees will often say, Mike or Christina or another lobbyist, stick to, the, stick to the fiscal implications. We don't care about the policy in this committee that was already dealt with in the policy committee. So they try to make you stick to the fiscal impact one way or another. And about 80% of the legislation introduced has some fiscal impact one way or another. If the bill um, provides fiscal benefits uh, to CLA, like some additional funding, then we of course support the bill. And in the case where it creates a burden, a fiscal burden like SB 34, then we'll do everything we can to try to stop the bill in that committee. And if the bill has a major impact, uh, then we will lobby all of the members of the committee there. But the fiscal committees uh, are much more difficult to lobby uh, because again, you're not allowed to talk policy very much. So in some cases we will get uh, again, members of the library community to write letters and urge the, their uh, members of the committee to oppose or support the bill. And then these days, once a bill reaches the assembly floor or some cases the Senate, if it's a bill that started on that side, it's almost certain to pass to the other house. In some of the old days, when the legislature was more balanced, there was often a chance that maybe you could stop a bill on the floor. But these days, very, very few uh, bills um, are stopped on the Senate floor. I mean, excuse me, on the assembly floor. And then once the bill is in the other house, in this case, the Senate, next slide, please, if you would, Paul. There we, there we have it, thank you. Um, so uh, essentially uh, we start all over again um, in that house and then um, we do just what we did on the assembly side. Um, we'll uh, oftentimes the bill has been amended by then but we will meet with the consultants of the policy committee in the Senate uh, and then uh, anybody else who's a member of the committees, we meet with their staff. If it's a bill, we have a strong position such as a strong support or oppose. And then if it happens to pass that committee and goes to the Senate um, Appropriations Committee, which is a fiscal committee, then we'll continue what we normally do there. And then the bill is ultimately uh, sent to the, the uh, Senate floor. Sometimes, next slide, please. Sometimes uh, if a bill is amended in the Senate, um, it must be returned to the assembly where the assembly will concur in the Senate amendments and vice versa. If it's a Senate bill that is amended in the assembly, then it would have to go back to the Senate for concurrence. And then it goes to the governor. In the event uh, that a bill happens to um, go through the second house without any amendments, then it heads uh, straight to the governor. 
Um, I'll pause there and see if there's any uh, questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, feel free to put those into the chat and we'll read those uh, out loud for everybody else and for anybody you. who's listening to the recorded version. Uh, Paul, before we uh, move on, I uh, would just like to add one other thing that's kind of important there, particularly as it involves the library community. And that's what we call the legislative timeline. We don't actually have a slide on this, but it's extremely important when we're asking you for help. Um, the deadline for introducing bills is usually the second or third Friday in February. So all of those 1600 assembly bills and uh, 800 Senate bills had to be what we call put across the desk and assigned by, with a number um, by uh, the, the few days after that deadline in February. And then bills uh, must be in print for 30 days before they can be heard. So as a consequence, um, you're looking essentially at the end of March or all of April for most of the bills to be considered in the policy committees. And that typically means that on major bills, when we ask the library community for uh, their support, meaning write support letters or oppose letters or contact members of the committees, you really have to do it um, prior uh, to that time. For example, uh, for a bill that might be scheduled for a hearing in early April, which is most of the bills in April, you would want to contact your uh, senator or assembly member two weeks ahead of time to make sure that the committee consultant has enough time to include your library's uh, support or opposition to the bill, or even sometimes you as an individual. So that's, that's very important. And uh, usually, uh, as I say, uh, a couple weeks ahead of, of the timeline when the bill is about to be heard in committee. And so if we ask you to write a letter or take some action, if you usually get it done by the first week in April, uh, we would be in pretty good shape. There are other important deadlines, uh, but this first com committee uh, deadline is by far the most important. Thank you. Mike and Christina, no questions from the audience so far, but uh, one quick one, since we're trying to encourage people to be better activists in all this, what's the one thing that people need to be doing early in the legislative process for anything that they feel strongly about? Christina, do you want to handle that one? Well, uh, you know, Early in the process, I think it's just mostly to look to our alerts. Uh, we call them the news from the Capitol reports. Uh, and Mike and I try to put out alerts. We'll put one after, out after the governor has introduced the budget. Uh, we'll put one out uh, when the budget subcommittees start meeting and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, and then if something is introduced like this uh, library card measure, they always wanna look for action um, steps from us. So some of our reports may be more narrative in nature. We may say, we just want to inform you about this issue. But then there are going to be, like Mike says, hard and fast deadlines. Well, we're going to need a letter. So we will put information out there that says, contact these people. These are the key people that we're looking to um, uh, make a connection with. These are the talking points, et cetera. So I think sometimes our news from the Capitol bulletins are the most important. And so if you don't subscribe to Calix or some of those other uh, CLA, um, you know, messaging and, and networking um, email chains, you would definitely want to make sure that you're connected there. Great. Thank you so much. Ready to move on? Great. I sure will. Okay. So on the next slide. Uh, Mike and I want to give kudos to the legislature for making various legislative tools free to the public. Um, I think it's marvelous because it draws people in and it helps to sunshine the process. And one such tool is uh, the shorthand name for it is Leginfo. But you'll see the uh, website there on your um, on your screen, and then also the email address, leginfo.legislature. Dot ca dot gov. And it's a free site for you or anyone you know who's interested in looking up a bill. And you might think, well, Mike and Christina, why in the world would I want to look up a piece of legislation? That's the kind of stuff that you, you lobbyists do. 
Well, one of the biggest reasons is, as I mentioned, Mike and I send out these regular news from the Capitol updates. And if a bill is of interest to CLA, we'll include an article, but we'll go into some detail, but not every little detail on the bill. And you may actually just want to pull up the bill and take a look at it yourself, or you may want to have your county council take a look at it, et cetera. So you can come to this site and there's, a, it's tiny there, but about three quarters of the way down the page, you will see a place where you can enter a bill number. And in this case, you might want to enter something like SB 34. And then uh, right underneath that word that says keywords, there is a blue bubble that says go. And you just click on that and that will uh, open up the bill for you. Now, lobbying firms pay tons and tons of money for really sophisticated bill tracking software. It's really important for us to keep a track of all of the 2000 plus plus bills that are introduced each year. But this is a site that I go to regularly because um, there are sections here, uh, uh, tabs here. One is called California Law, where I can pull up uh, legal um, verbiage that's very important for me in trying to figure out uh, maybe what other entities have in terms of, of uh, law on this particular subject matter. There are also uh, tabs here called other, res uh, other resources, and you can find a link there to the state Senate, the state library, the legislative analyst's office, the state archives, et cetera. Next slide. Before we do that, there is one quick question you might want to address while we're on this one. Yes. Uh, one of our audience members is asking or commenting on, would love to see California Info app, a California information app, info app that is user-friendly and updated in real time. Are either of you familiar with one of those? Well, I'm not familiar with an app, Paul, but I will ask around. Um, that's an excellent idea, frankly. Great, thank you. Okay, in this next slide, after we've clicked on that blue bubble I mentioned, it'll take us to a screen that looks like this. And the site is always going to default to the most current version of the bill. So in this case, SB 34, that library card measure we mentioned, was amended on May 20th, and that is the most current version. And once you have the bill on your screen in this form, you can just scroll up or down to see all of the pages. And then, of course, if you want to grab a PDF version, you can find that here. Um, also, if you want to see previous versions of the bill, there's a bubble about one third of the way down the page there, and you can choose the, the drop down version and choose whichever one you'd like. The tool that you would likely most use is a tab that reads bill analysis, and each policy and fiscal committee produces a very detailed write up on every bill. And what they do is there's a committee consultant who's on staff for every policy committee or fiscal committee and they write it and they go around and they obtain information from the supporters, the opponents, people who still have concerns with the bill, people who are asking for amendments. But it is a great way to get more of a summary write up on what the bill does. It also shows a list of who's supporting and who's opposing. So if you go to the back page and you look for that, you'll see, oh geez, on this particular bill, only five people support it, but 35 people hate it. Hmm, that bill might be in a little bit of trouble. So the analysis can tell you an awful lot. Also, if you wanna know how a legislator voted on a particular piece of legislation, there is a tab here called votes. And uh, there you can see both committee and floor votes. And then Mike now is going to take you through a series of how to actually read SB 34. And he's going to talk about how CLA's opposition helped to shape the bill. Next slide. Before I do that, I would like to digress just for a moment and uh, touch on something Christina just mentioned about the ability to pull up the analyses on some bills. I would recommend that when the session wraps up today or sometime in the next day or so. While this is fresh on your mind, try it. Go to any one of the 1,600 bills on the assembly or 800 on the Senate and just pick some bill and try it. Some bills may not have gone very far and it will tell you that. Others may be complicated bills and you can see the consultant's analysis there. 
The reason I mention this is because over the summer, uh, there were TV ads and some newspaper ads just condemning this terrible bill by an author who typically wouldn't carry a terrible bill that would hurt consumers. And I kept thinking, wow, why are they attacking that legislator? And what is so terrible about this bill? So ultimately I did exactly what Christina just explained. I thought, hmm, I'm gonna pull that bill up and I'm gonna see what the darn thing says. Well, that bill was sponsored by a major special interest corporation who typically does not have consumers interest at hand. Um, so um, that was very revealing to me and I would have not known that if I hadn't gone to the trouble to pull up that analysis. It didn't relate to any of our clients, but I was just curious what is going on with this bill. The consultant's analysis made it very clear who was in support and who was in opposition. So uh, at some point, if you see some bill in the newspaper or whatever, remember how to pull them up because oftentimes um, what you'll find is just very interesting. And also you'll be surprised at how many groups have organizations that support or oppose legislation. Many of them you will never have heard from or heard of, excuse me, uh, but it's very interesting. So give it a try. Now, moving on to, um, uh, how, how to read a bill. Um, if you have close-up reading glasses, although this is, this is not too bad, uh, I know the print is fairly small, but we'll try to uh, walk through it. Uh, we chose SB 34 because this was the most important bill that we've dealt with in, in quite some time. So we're going to be a little bit technical at the beginning, um, but there's no test uh, at the end of this session. Um, and uh, uh, you'll, but you will be more expert in reading some of these bills. SB 34 is a bit unusual because in capital parlance, it is what we call a gut and amend. That means uh, as the bill was introduced, you will see there on December 7th, 19, uh, 2020, uh, it related to election polling places. Then the first amendment on February 24th completely amended the bill to a totally new subject, and that is the library student success card. So that's something um, that's a, a little bit in-house, uh, you might say, but uh, typically a bill like this, the first iteration of the bill, it would all be in bold, and then any uh, changes subsequently would be in italics. And then, um, as we go along, um, we try to point this out because um, if, if this bill was amending a section as opposed to just uh, in, in this instance, putting in a new section, the next slide, maybe Paul, please. Thank you. Um, you, you can see there um, that the, the, at the bottom says the mission of the public libraries is to provide. So that's the people of state of California do an act. If it, that was an amended bill, it would say the people of the state of California uh, amend, uh, propose to amend this particular bill. Um, next slide, uh, Paul, please. Okay. Um, and here you can see that uh, the bill on line 27 there, it, it uh, contains the a totally new section there actually on line 22 it shows uh, that this section is added. Oftentimes you will see that that uh, is amended in this situation. And future um, uh, um, amendments to this bill will show in bold. And then if there's another amendment after that, the, that bold will be in italic. So we often tell our members of the committee, keep all of the versions of the bill. Otherwise uh, you'll get completely lost if you only keep uh, one, one uh, um, version of the bill. But uh, if all else fails, the Legislative Council does a wonderful job in explaining what the bill does. And so each time the bill is amended, they will actually explain what the new amendments do as well as, as what the current version of the bill does. Uh, next slide. So um, this uh, version of the bill, um, 
one of our biggest concerns was the requirement for a memorandum of understanding. So if you look down on line 33, um, it says the memorandum of understanding shall be for five years. Well, some of our libraries that have entered into these agreements on a voluntary basis may have done it for three years or two years or not put a provision in there in terms of a specific requirement. So that was a concern to the legislative committee. And so uh, this version of the bill on April 6 uh, amended that out. Uh, next slide. And in the meantime, CLA still continued to oppose the bill. Another big issue uh, that was of concern was uh, how do you how do you share uh, the costs? And um, uh, so that also uh, was a big issue because libraries were traditionally telling us that um, in the voluntary agreements that they had done, about 70% of the costs, such as attorney fees and trying to get the information from the school districts for individual students for the library card, that usually a, the library ended up doing about 75% and sometimes the schools 25% uh, in terms of, uh, of um, attorney fees and that type of thing. So, uh, this, this issue or online, on, online um, one starting there, uh, it at least included a provision for how costs would be shared. But CLA still continued uh, to oppose the bill because it continued uh, with, the, with the mandate. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the May twenty uh, fourth, uh, the May twentieth version of the bill. Excuse me, and um, as a result, really, of all the collective voices uh, that um, came from you and um, our, our opposition and specific information that we were able to get from the the legislative committee members, um, we just kept hammering a mandate, mandate, mandate. And as in, during that hearing that Christina mentioned. Um, the very first policy committee meeting, um, virtually every member of the committee was saying, why are we mandating this on the libraries and the schools as well? Because the bill also impacted small school districts, again, using Senator Dolly as an example, all of his, most all of his school districts are small and most of his libraries are relatively small. So he had, a, he had major concerns with the mandate and we continued to push on that concern uh, throughout the entire process. So ultimately, uh, as you see there um, on line four, um, the bill became contingent upon of uh, state funding and then the Department of Education would provide grants to districts and libraries that applied. So again, not a mandate, but that they applied for this funding. And then um, with this amendment, uh, CLA actually switched our uh, position from a post to a support and we so indicated to uh, the author and other appropriate uh, uh, people that needed to be aware of that change in position. Uh, but since no funding was actually provided in the budget, uh, then uh, the bill uh, failed to pass the Senate floor where it remains. It did pass out of the Appropriations Committee with that amendment, um, but it remains on the Senate floor and will probably stay there unless at some point the governor were to include some uh, money in the budget for these agreements. Thank you. All right, next slide. Thank you. I talked earlier about the free access to the uh, Ledge Info website. Well, there's also uh, very nice free websites courtesy of the Senate and the Assembly. And again, it's free to anyone who wants to access it. Um, Say you heard about an upcoming hearing, maybe the SB 34 hearing in Senate Education Committee, and you don't wanna testify, but you just wanna listen in. And maybe you were one of the library directors that was contacted by CLA, and you had provided some information to Senator Cortese or Senator Pan, and you wanted to hear, geez, did he use the information I provided, uh, or how did he vote? And so this is a great way to watch the hearing. Um, it's incredibly easy. On the day of the hearing, you just go to the assembly website, www.assembly.ca.gov if the bill is being heard in the assembly, 
or you go over to the Senate side, www.senate.ca.gov, if the bill is being heard over there. And you look on the right-hand side of the homepage where it says today's events. Now, if you were to go to the Senate's page today, the legislature is not in session, so you're not gonna see a whole lot, but you'd see a note that reads, the Senate has adjourned until Monday, January 3, 2022 at 2 p.m. But typically you'd see like on a Thursday morning that the Senate floor was going in you'd see that the Senate Education Committee was going in on a Wednesday. So in that space, you would click on the tab that reads full details of today's Senate events. And it's going to take you to a page that shows all of the hearings for that day. And you just find the hearing that you're interested in. And let's say you wanted to watch Senate Education on Wednesday morning. When you're about five to 10 minutes away from the start of the hearing on that day, there's gonna be a new tab that pops up and it's going to say watch under Senate education. Click on that link and it's gonna load the hearing for you and the hearing will start live when the chair gavels the uh, hearing to order. Often I find that if I go to that page too early, you know, say a half an hour before the hearing starts, the watch tab will not be readily present. And so that's why I suggest if you're gonna go look for that hearing, just wait until about five to 10 minutes before it starts and that tab should be there for you. All right, next slide. Now the legislature has also made it easier uh, for the public to testify directly in legislative hearings at the Capitol. And I'm gonna speak first about testifying in person. This is what Mike and I have done essentially for our entire careers until we had that thing called COVID and that just changed everything. Um, but when lobbyists testify in person, this is essentially how it works. We find out if bills are going to be heard at the hearing in file order, or sign-in order. And file order means that the committee secretary for the policy committee or the fiscal committee has listed the bills for that day in numerical order. And then the authors of the bills are required to show up in that order to present their bills. Now, then there's a thing called the sign-in order. And I don't love it because it's pretty hard to follow, particularly if you're following at home on a laptop or something. What sign-in order means is that the sergeant at arms keeps a list over on the side. Um, he's stationed in each committee room or she is stationed in each committee room. They put out a sign-in sheet and say the hearing starts at 9 a.m. Well, you might see Senator Connie Leva come rushing in at 8.50 in the morning and she signs in first. And then maybe Senator Dodd comes in and he signs in next. And so they will take up Senator Leva and Senator Dodd in that order and so on and so on. The problem is, as a lobbyist, Mike and I always need to go up to the sergeant and say, hey, you know, is Senator Leva signed in? And he says, yes, yes, yes. No, she's on the list right here. She's going to be first. And then he shows us the rest of the list of who's signed in. And the committee will go in that order then. Now, on the Assembly or Senate side um, site that we were just talking about, when you go to look for the hearing, you can also click on a tab that will give you the agenda for the day. So that's going to tell you the order of where your bill flows, the one that you're interested in. Now, an example of testifying in person, um, Senator Dodd carried a really important bill for CLA a few years ago. Mike might talk about it in a second. And CLA was considered the sponsor of that bill. So prior to uh, the hearing in the policy committee, um, CLA will decide who would be a great spokesperson for the measure. Who's gonna be able to hit the expert points in their testimony? Who's gonna be able to make that great impact? And then we work with the author's office to try to identify those two key people. Now, in the case of Senator Dodd's measure, he's very close with a local official who he works with a lot. And he said, you know, I'd really love it if she could be one of my lead witnesses because he's from Napa and she's from Napa. That just made a lot of sense. She's a dynamic public speaker, uh, really sharp, very connected. And we knew that she would do a heck of a job defining the local needs for the 
for the bill. The second person we chose was Mike because he has so much history on this issue. Uh, he would be able to respond very um, appropriately to all of the questions that uh, he might get from committee members. And we have a sense most of the time as to how the hearing might go because we do a lot of legwork leading up to a hearing. Um, Mike and I will have been behind the scenes working on support letters, uh, talking to legislators and their staff, trying to encourage them to vote for the bill. We're collecting data and lots of local uh, examples as we did with the library card bill. We're working with the committee consultant who's writing that analysis that I talked about. And we're just trying to cover all of our bases. And then the author's going to open with a brief statement on the bill, uh, talking about its importance. And then the two lead witnesses for the support will go next. And usually each witness only gets about two minutes, which can be very frustrating. So you have to be tight and concise with your messaging. And then after the lead support witnesses present their testimony, the chair is gonna ask, are there additional supporters in the room? And those folks are only allowed to state their name, their affiliation, and your position on the bill. And you'll often hear the chairs use the term uh, we're ready to hear from the me too's in support. And so that means at that moment, you would go over to a microphone on the side of the room. You would say, good morning, I am Sally Smith. I represent the Friends of the Library group from Sonoma and I am in support of the measure. If you're not affiliated with a group, that's not a problem at all. You can just represent yourself and say, Good morning, I'm Sally Smith. I'm a resident of Napa and I'm in support of the measure. But if you try to say something more than that, oh, heaven help you because the chair will shoot you down like you can't believe. They'll yell things like, no, thank you, next. We told you just name and affiliation, please. Um, we always find that when you go against the uh, instructions of the chair, it never works out well for you. So always follow the decorum that, that they lay out. And so we're hearing very, with, very loudly and clearly from you, follow orders if you want to be successful, right? <laughs> That's exactly right, Paul. You got it. And then the lead opposition witnesses are going to come forward. We're going to repeat that process uh, all over again. And then they're going to debate the bill and the vote will be taken. And next slide. There's also a new way to testify on bills and that is via the telephone. And it has made the legislative process so much more accessible to folks who cannot come to the Capitol in person. And so this is a really great option for you. During COVID, because so many of us were not supposed to be in the building unless it was some sort of special uh, accommodation like Mike and I talked about with the SB 34 hearing, we were all as lobbyists really relegated to the phone system and they've got it working now uh, really well. Um, and I give them uh, lots of kudos for that. If you go back to the home pages for the assembly or the Senate, they have a tab at the top of each of their pages and it's a tab called committees. And if you were going to go testify in the Senate Education Committee, you would just click on Senate Education and it would take you to an excellent primer on each of the policy committee pages for how you go about testifying by phone. Each committee is going to have their own phone number and their own access code. Those are available there on the committee site, but the chair is also going to go through the process of announcing that phone number and that access number at the start of every hearing. So you have it in two places. And then personally, I would recommend if you're going to do that, you watch the hearing on your laptop or your desktop as long as you possibly can. And then when it looks like they're getting close to your bill, you can start calling in on the phone because otherwise then you have to hang on the phone all day. And some of these hearings will go four, five, six hours. That's not unusual. So um, that's a tip for you. And then Feel free to let us know in the chat box if you have ever um, testified in the Capitol, if you've ever used our new phone system, how did you find the process? Um, was it hard to navigate? Was it easy? Was watching the hearing like watching paint dry? <laughs> uh, feel free to let us know. 
And then Mike, you are next with the next slide. Well, thank you, Christina. And I would also echo what Christina said. Uh, sometime next April, put a little note on your calendar uh, to pull up one of the hearings. It could be education or local government or whatever. And uh, it's quite enlightening. You will find uh, all types of individuals uh, testifying. And sometimes when they line up, uh, on the side of the big room 4202 or 4203, uh, you, you look at somebody and say, uh oh, I wonder what this person is going to say. And sometimes they will say things that will, um, quite frankly, amaze you. And sometimes uh, they're asked to leave the hearing room. So, in any Mike, event, uh, Mike and Christina, you've got a couple of responses in the chat. Um, Reed says she's testified and that it's been great fun. And Michael says, when I've done a Me Too by phone, I found that the video stream was often later than what was actually happening. And they're asking the question here, has that been fixed yet or is that still a situation that anybody's gonna face? Hmm. No, Michael, I'm so glad you raised that because there is a definite delay and it will completely screw you up if you um, are watching the laptop version versus uh, listening on the phone. The one that's live is actually the phone. And so if you wait to call in um, when you're watching on your laptop, you may miss the bill. It's incredible. So they have not fixed that lag and it's quite frustrating. So like I say, watch the, the hearing for as long as you dare on your laptop and then transfer over to the phone, start calling in and you hear the whole thing live on the phone. And then uh, there's operators who will give you a designated number uh, and they'll say, uh, number one, nine, your line is open. And you'll say, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. This is Christina DeCaro representing the California Library Association. We're in strong support of the bill. Thank you. And then that's it. Um, and then they'll take you uh, take you out of the queue. So, um, Michael, right on. You're absolutely right. And Emery, thank you so much for testifying. That's fantastic. Thank you. No further questions from our participants at this point, Your Honors. Mike, back to you. Great. Thank you. Well, on the screen before you, uh, it says library construction bonds. Uh, much of my uh, Christina's and my efforts every year is trying to get additional funding for library programs through the budget process that Christina is going to talk about uh, in a minute. And that is really a heavy, heavy lift. But occasionally we'll get a bill like SB 34 on the legislative side, and that becomes a, a heavy, heavy lift as well. But over the years, uh, CLA has sponsored uh, major legislation. And just a few examples. The first one here is uh, library construction bonds. Uh, in the early years, we were pretty successful over a, an 18 year period and three governors, if you can believe it, we were successful in getting three library bonds uh, on the ballot. Uh, the first two were approved by the voters and unfortunately uh, in 2006, a 400, uh, excuse me, a $600 million library bond in 2006 uh, was not approved by the voters. Um, but throughout this whole process, uh, getting, uh, the library community involved was probably the big takeaway, in particular, uh, particular the roles that the library um, community and um, also the library community at large uh, played, friends of the library, uh, all library staff, because this was all hands on decks. Hundreds of you wrote uh, letters in support, you contacted your legislators, uh, you explained your facility needs, uh, which were huge. You provided, provided specific information to the state library uh, for a survey that they were doing. And uh, based on the information you provided, the state library uh, did what they call a needs survey. And at the time that was over $4 billion. And then they went to a lot of trouble to break it down by assembly and Senate district. And that was huge. So Christina and I would use that information when we would go around and talk to legislators and you could really get their attention when you would say, Senator, Assembly members, we see here that you have uh, about three or four hundred million dollars in needs in your uh, among all of your libraries in your assembly or Senate district. And it was really helpful in letting us get that measure enacted. All of that information that the library community, when I say community, I mean everybody from top to bottom that Christina mentioned earlier, 
uh, all of that information that was provided on the library bonds, we were also able to use uh, when we were making a push for uh, a 55% local vote for library construction bonds. Um, um, excuse me, for uh, uh, Paul, if you would um, go to the next slide. Thanks. I, I did not mean library construction bonds there. Um, we used that information there, but we also were able to use all of that information when we were asking for the passage of library construction bonds with a 55% local vote. Our feeling was that um, with all of the competition for bonds these days and, uh, and uh, libraries trying to get construction bonds for libraries alone was just going to be a, a really uphill battle. And so we thought, well, maybe we could get 55% for a local vote like school districts have, although school districts did it by an initiative. It wasn't through the legislative process. If we were able to get that, then that would be a huge uh, event for public libraries. What we were able to do was use all of that information we had for every uh, legislator's district that you had provided. And we said, the, the needs are still there. We are unable to get a bond, but how about allowing us um, the authority to pass local bond measures with a 55% vote? Again, uh, that was kind of an uphill battle. And um, one of the critic criticisms we faced was, gee, why are we doing 55% vote for libraries only, cities, counties, fire, police, et cetera, all need facilities as well. So since then, uh, almost every year, uh, we make an effort in conjunction with cities, counties, and special districts to, to try to enact 55% uh, for a local vote. The next slide, Paul. Patron, uh, protecting patron privacy and library circulate, uh, circulation records um, has been an ongoing effort for CLA over the years, but particularly uh, in the 1980s, uh, protecting both patient privacy and the circulation records became a big, big issue. So S Senator David Roberti, who later became the Senate president, um, authored uh, CLA legislation to make sure that whatever, whatever anyone read uh, or borrowed from the library would remain confidential. And then a um, number of years later, it was realized that gee, that's probably not even sufficient. We may need to make that law stronger. So Senator Joe Simidian, a good friend of ours, a good friend of CLA's as well, uh, authored legislation to protect all matters of personal property. Emails were becoming uh, a new thing then. And for example, if a, if a library patron, a card holder emailed the library and asked if they had Catcher in the Rye or some other uh, publication, that information would be strictly confidential. And with some pride, uh, we like to say that the California law became the first one in the nation. And after our law was enacted, then uh, other states uh, did the same. Um, before I turn it over to Christina, I would mention that over the years, CLA has sponsored some other major uh, pieces of legislation. One of them is still used today was the ability of libraries to cities or counties primarily to institute a one eight cents sales tax uh, for library needs uh, does take a two thirds vote, but at least the authority is there. And a number of jurisdictions have taken advantage of that and have enacted um, a one eight cents sales tax, which periodically does need to be renewed. So with that, I turn it over to Christina. And I'll turn it over to Paul. Yeah. Okay. So let's, <laughs> before we get into the uh, quick discussion with the audience here, We've had a lot of information here We've and key points to take away here are if you go back to the slide deck at all or you have been taking notes from what Mike and Christina said, you've got that resource of the legislative info site that you can go to if you want to get information on things that are there. You've learned a little bit from the two of them about how to go into the live sessions. You've heard the ups and downs about that in terms of listening for that lag that may be on your laptop as opposed to the phone. So quick tip if you're still getting used to Zoom and online things. 
keep in mind that what you're seeing on the screen may be different from what you're hearing on the phone and what may be going on in the room. Any of us using Zoom over a long period of time have faced that where we get totally confused because we're presenting. We see something coming back to us that is either a half a minute behind us or a half minute ahead of us. And you just can't let that throw you. So follow the tips you've gotten from the experts here. Susan is just putting a comment here. Thanks to the Dillons for all the great support for California libraries over the years. And I think all of us probably would at this point, even before we get to the end of it, want to give them a round of applause for everything they've done. Now, with that virtual round of applause going, let's get a little bit of feedback from you in the chat. Uh, and I see for Mary, huge fan, yes. Mike and Christina, you don't want to see that because your heads are going to explode and then the, the whole <laughs> picture here will be high. But clearly you have fans out there who are deeply appreciative. Let us look at a couple of questions here. Respond, please, in chat so that we can share this with each other. What experience do you have engaging with the legislative process? If you want to tell a quick two or three line story in there, I'll read that as they come in. If you have none, just put none in. If you have experience and you just want to leave it at that, say have experience so that we can pace this and not have a lot of silence. But for anyone listening to the archive version, we're going to have about 60 seconds of silence while we wait for people in the live session to put those comments in. And if this were commercially sponsored, this would be the point where we would mention our sponsor. But obviously here, I want to make clear to anybody who isn't clear on a concept, California Library Association is the sponsor of the program, the organizers. We have a lot on online in the CLA site that tells you about advocacy and we're developing a pretty robust uh, setup, a page in there with advocacy tools. So if you haven't seen that yet, check that one out. Uh, sorry to see the comments come in and let's I'll just back up here slightly to see what's come in. From Melinda, many years of experience. And I wanna thank you for that because obviously that's making a difference for us. Michael, meeting with legislators once a year to let them know if library issues we're, in, we're concerned about. Deborah, getting to know the legislators. Oh, making a point here, very important one. Getting to know your legislators and their staff is important. You don't always have to go straight to the top with the legislator. Working with the legislative aides is sometimes very effective because that opens the doors that you wanna have open. From Southern California librarian working on letters from cooperative system chairs to legislation in support of the budget initiatives. And from Michelle, some legislative day and letter writing and local ledge meetings. So obviously we've got an audience that's already engaged. And we're hoping that what you're hearing, especially from Mike and Christina today and from your peers via the chat inspires you to keep going further with this. So let's get to one other question here and then move on with the comments from our uh, main presenters. What challenges do you need to overcome as you consider engaging with the legislative process? And I'll pose those to Mike and Christina as quickly as they come in and see if there's anything else that's coming in the chat. There is a question here from Mary. How, uh, Mike and Christina, how can we utilize the CLA legislative priorities to advocate better in our local platforms? There's a second question, but let's hold on, on that first. Again, how can we utilize the CLA legislative priorities to advocate better in our local platforms? Well, that is such a timely question <laughs> because we're working on the legislative priorities right now as a committee. I'll talk a little bit about the legislative priorities in a bit, but... Um, they are really the keys to what you would want to advocate for during your day in the district meetings or your meetings up at the state capitol. We'll also talk a little bit about day in the district, but those are really the, uh, the marching orders, if you will, that will let you know what CLA as a collective group is advocating for that year so that everybody is kind of on the same messaging. Thank you. Second part of that question from Mary is also ERAF. Anything new on that side? Could you define for the rest of us what ERAF is? <laughs> oh, Paul, well, Paul, maybe I'll take a stab. ERAF stands for ERAF, and uh, that's a, a, a term that's hardly used anymore. Uh, years ago, when Proposition 13 passed, a lot of local governments uh, lost uh, a lot of their property taxes, about 26 or 27 of our big libraries like Orange County, Riverside and others that had, uh, had instituted property taxes just for the libraries years ago, uh, lost about half of their property tax funding and other special districts were affected likewise as were cities and counties. And part of the, it's very complicated, but and the bottom line is over the years of uh, some of the local governments, including some of the special 
libraries were trying to get some additional funding, some offsets and so forth. And so the, uh, the ERAF, the, uh, forgot what the E stands for. But well, Linda put it in for us, Mike. It's yes. the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. Thanks, That's Melinda. It. Yeah. Nice to have yeah. librarians in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else you want to add, or shall I go on with a couple and of no, other that, comments? No, that, that's, that's pretty much it. That doesn't affect that many libraries anymore. Thanks. Sarah's coming in with a comment about uh, experience, including coordinating with our county leadership, getting library issues into the county's legislative uh, priorities. And understand here, whether you're in the live session or watching the archive version, one of the real gems of reading these comments is it makes you aware of other things. That's why we oftentimes talk about our, our partners in a, pro in a program like this as being our co-conspirators in learning. Because as Sarah talks about coordinating with county leadership and getting those library issues into the county's legislative priorities, gives the rest of us an idea of what we might also be doing. Deborah has come back in with a comment about sometimes I think people forget how important it is to get your direct knowledge of your meetings with legislators and staffs back to the CLA Legislative Committee and to Mike and Christina. And in case we don't uh, remember to show you the final slide, there is a slide in the deck that refers you back to CLA's legislative page. So your librarians, you know how to look stuff up and you know how to track us down. So keep that in mind also. Michelle's asking, did Christina say she will mention some of the CLA? Yeah, actually, she's about to do that in one of our sections. And Mary comes in with the comment that I'm sure some of us will raise our hands and go, yeah, I want my ERAF back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the second part of this. And as soon as I can get a slide there, you're on, Mike and Christina. Bravo. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for the feedback. It's really, really interesting to us. Um, so while all of the craziness is going on with bill hearings, there is a completely different process going on simultaneously, and that is the creation of and debate over the annual state budget. And Mike and I thought it might be helpful for you to understand the difference between the two processes. And it's particularly important to understand the budget process because so much of CLA's priorities, particularly of late, are focused on getting more funding in the state budget for various library projects. CLA is a very unusual client in that they require us to work on both tracks, both legislative and both uh, budget. I have colleagues, Mike has colleagues, uh, that will never have any activity in the state budget just by virtue of who they represent as a client. And next slide, Paul. So Mike explained the legislative process and how bills need to be uh, moved through the committees and floor by certain hard deadlines. Well, the same is true for the budget process and some of the dates are even embedded in the constitution or are completely immovable. Now, starting right about now, Governor Newsom and his team uh, from the Director of Finance are putting together the 2022-23 state budget. And they're taking a look at various state and federal uh, financial projections in order to determine uh, how much money might actually be available for expenditures starting in January. And as you know, things can fluctuate really wildly, even in a uh, within a given year. And so the state is due for another recession correction. And most governors uh, try to be very pragmatic when they roll out that January budget, just trying not to grossly overspend just in case. Now, during this time, the state library is also submitting funding requests to the governor, as is the California Library Association in the hopes that maybe the governor might incorporate our collective asks into the January budget. The state constitution requires the governor to release the budget no later than January 10th. And typically the governor's gonna hold a press conference that day and then he's going to roll out uh, a document that explains his spending priorities in a little bit more detail. And then during the months between February and May, the budget subcommittees are going to meet to review the budget. Now, who are the budget subcommittees? Well, essentially the Senate budget committee and the assembly budget committee are very, very large in their size. So what they do is they break them down into various subject matter committees or subcommittees that will hear various parts of the budget. For example, there's a subcommittee that deals only with health and human services issues. There's a subcommittee that deals only with uh, resources. So that would be water, that would be environmental protection issues. And then there is one subcommittee in each house 
called the Subcommittee on Education Finance. And this is where issues affecting public libraries and the state library in the budget are heard. The subcommittees review the governor's budget and they can adopt parts of it, they can reject parts of it, they can replace proposals with their own proposals. And almost every year, uh, CLA asks Mike and I to lobby the members of the subcommittees and our job one year might be say, go ask for more money for the California Library Services Act, um, or go ask for more funding to connect more libraries uh, to the high-speed broadband network operated by Scenic, which is the Corporation for Education Network Initiatives in California. Or sometimes, and these are really tough, it's trying to save a library program from a deep cut that is uh, proposed, such as the deep cuts that Governor Brown was making when he took his uh, first try in office uh, back in 2011 when he was trying to balance the budget during the recession. To lobby the budget subcommittees is a really difficult task and CLA is essentially asking for money right alongside lobbyists and leaders in entities like uh, the University of California, uh, CSU. They might be asking for things like more student housing, uh, money to offset uh, higher tuition. We're also competing with people who need more money for childcare. Um, and so there's only so much money to go around and you kind of get the picture. It's, you know, a feeding frenzy. And also during the deep cuts during the 2011 recession, Governor Brown said, you know, I think that, you know, funding libraries should be a local responsibility and not a state responsibility. And so that was one of the reasons why he suggested that uh, all of the money be stripped out in the 2011 budget. So we're not only lobbying just subcommittees, we're lobbying the governor and his Department of Finance as well. Next slide. And then towards the end of May, those subcommittees are gonna recommend uh, things to the full budget committees in the Senate and Assembly. These are our proposals. And on the Assembly side, they're gonna take all of those recommendations and they're gonna put it into one budget bill. And then on the Senate side, they're gonna take all those recommendations and put it into one Senate bill. The problem is that most times than not, the two houses do not jive in terms of their funding priorities. So on the Senate side, they may say, you know, we want more money for housing and homelessness and wildfire relief. And on the assembly side, they may say, yeah, we care about those, but we also care a little bit more about funding K-12 education. And so therein lies uh, the battle. And so because there are differences in those two versions, it forces it into a reconciliation process and that is called the Budget Conference Committee, which will convene in June. And the process is like watching a really, really interesting dance. You have the governor's Department of Finance come up and sit at a front table and they're stressing the importance of backing all of the governor's proposals. And then you have the legislative analyst who also comes forward to sit at the front table. And they're supposed to be the sort of objective, um, nonpartisan entity that reviews the governor's budget. And then you have a, a select group of assembly members and senators who are going to sit on the dais and kind of hash this whole thing out. There is no public comment at this point. Um, Mike and I could not go up to a microphone and try to influence the proceedings. We have to do it all behind the scenes, uh, keep pushing, pushing, pushing uh, our issues. And then finally, when the conference committee believes that they have the makings of an agreement with the governor, the Democrat leadership, and the committee itself, they will create one main budget bill and then these related trailer bills, you sometimes hear them called, and they implement various provisions of the budget and then they send it to the floor for a vote. Next slide. The legislature is required to pass the state budget uh, via the rules of the constitution by June 15th or they forfeit their pay. Uh, the governor then has until July 1 to sign or veto the budget that was sent to him. And he also has the authority to go back into the budget and blue pencil or reduce certain items, which can be totally heartbreaking for a lobbyist like me and Mike, who have worked so hard to put something into the budget. But this year there was so much agreement between the two houses and the governor, there was no need for the blue pencil notations, thankfully. All right, next slide. 
So there was a question about CLA's legislative priorities and how they kind of weave into all of this. Well, Mike and I take our direction from the CLA Legislative Committee and the, legis uh, the uh, CLA Executive Board. And each year, the Legislative Committee develops a list of issues that they deem important to the library community and they establish this list of priorities. And these are important for several reasons. First of all, it's Mike and my marching orders. So whatever the uh, association would like, this is what we follow. And then it defines for the CLA membership what issues CLA believes are critical to fight for and advocate for. Now also, if a legislator comes to me and Mike and says, where does CLA stand on providing more money for lunch at the library, for example, then we can take a look at this list and say, oh, yes, 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 CLA would love for us to fight for more money for lunch at the library this year. Next slide. There was a time about 10 years ago or so when the legislative committee didn't do the priorities document for a couple of years. And during that time, we had a great assemblyman, Assemblyman Mike Gatto of the Burbank area. And he and his staff came to me and Mike and said, geez, we'd love to do something for libraries in the budget. And so what are your priorities this year? And we went, uh oh. So the committee then scrambled to come up with a list of uh, top priorities. And then Mr. Gatto was able to weave it into uh, a letter to the leadership and then into the budget process. Now, believe it or not, these are totally hard fought debates within the legislative committee because everybody has different interests and different priority projects that they like to support. But as you know, they can't, we can't fund everything. So we try to do our very best to come up with some good uh, ideas and make everybody happy. That discussion regarding the 2022 platform is currently taking place in the legislative committee right now. And the document is gonna be finalized before the end of the year, and then it will be posted after the first part of the year on the CLA, a website likely under the advocacy tools. Christine, Next an obvious slide. question. Yes. An obvious question here. If there are people listening to the live or participating in the live version today, what do they do to give input to the legislative committee? You know, that's a great question, Paul. I think if, if we get to your slide at the end where you have the, um, the recommendation that they contact the legislative chairs, so right now that our two legislative chairs currently until we turn over in November are um, uh, Yolande and Mike Eitner. And so, um, and Yolande is out of Torrance, uh, Mike Eitner is out of Solano uh, and they've just been fantastic. And um, they would be able to take feedback from you if you were interested in weighing in on say, boy, that, that lunch at the library, I could serve so many more kids if I thought that, you know, we just could get a little bit more money in the budget. So I think uh, those two folks, I don't want to bombard them with a lot of information uh, and outreach, but I do think that they're, um, they're probably very interested in hearing from the field right now. Hey, just, Holly's been great about putting some of the links in here. Holly, if you can grab the one for the legislative committee and put that into chat, that would be wonderful. Okay, great. Thanks for the next slide. Um, let us give you an example of one of CLA's biggest budget successes in order to give you a sense of how this all works. Uh, last year, the legislature was cutting programs in the budget, anticipating that the pandemic was just gonna have a disastrous impact on the state budget. And this year there was that massive surplus due to better than anticipated tax receipts, plus money we were getting from the federal government for COVID bailout. Uh, issues. But sometimes there's as much drama and conflict when you have a budget that is flush and in budgets where you're doing a lot of cutting. Now, the governor, to his credit, has been a big supporter of public libraries. Uh, he included money for zip books and lunch at the library in his January budget. And then later, when he rolled out a document called the May Revise, which updates the budget in May, he also included additional funding for things like bookmobiles and after school library programs and broadband funding for libraries. This year, the Senate Democrats released a budget proposal of their own called the Build Back Boldly Package. And when it was shared with the capital community, state librarian Greg Lucas sent it to me and Mike and said, I assume you've seen this. Well, we had not yet and we literally almost passed out on the floor. We could not believe it. It contained 1 billion, and that is billion with a B, for library infrastructure projects. And this 
proposal was instantly the biggest thing that we had ever seen in its size and scope for public libraries in, in our career with CLA. Amazing. The second proposal was a little bit vague in how it was written, but it indicated an intention to try to identify funding so that library fines could be forgiven. Now you can imagine when uh, the legislature develops a pro project like this, it takes an extraordinary amount on the part of the lobbyists and CLA to try to get the legislature, the data and the information that they are going to need to help shore up the proposal. It's one thing to roll it out. It's another thing to follow it through to the end. And so on one afternoon, Mike and I received four emails from the Senate budget staff asking for historical background on all our past library bonds. They wanted to know information on the needs assessments, uh, the universe of all of the library finds out there. Uh, and then a request for a primer on what is the Public Library Foundation, which was a program that gave libraries discretionary funding years ago, uh, but it was zeroed out, unfortunately, when Governor Brown came into office. We got emails from budget staff at all hours. Uh, we had to deliver on this project in a very, very tight time frame. And Mike and I convened conference calls with the CLA president, past president, uh, legislative chairs, current and past, to gain insight on their preferences for how funding might be distributed under the library fine proposal. Uh, these leaders were so helpful to us during these discussions. We also needed to take the temperature of how big the infrastructure grants should be. Should they be small and then you spread it out and help more libraries or should they be larger and they help a larger library projects? Um, we were working not only with budget staff, but with the Senate President Pro Tem staff, because this was a Democrat caucus plan. And the last thing we want to do is disappoint the Pro Tem and not be prepared to assist her at a moment's notice. And the State Library was also very active in these negotiations, as you can imagine. We kept our lines of communication open throughout this process in order to keep things updated as things were moving very, very, very fast. We had lobbyist colleagues who saw this package and said, um, my word, I saw the $1 billion package for the libraries. How in the heck did you guys pull that off? And we said, oh my gosh, you guys, we have been begging and pleading and begging and pleading for years for more library funding. And we just hope that now it's finally paid off. And also the Senate President Pro Tem, Tony Atkins has long been a big library supporter as has the budget chair, Senator Nancy Skinner. And so we thank them and Senator John Laird, who was the chair of the budget subcommittee who heard these issues. And of course, the state librarian for all of his hard work and the governor. So uh, bravo. In the end, the Senate negotiated this proposal with the governor and the assembly. There was a collective agreement to provide a lesser amount for the library infrastructure grants, but the budget that the governor ultimately signed on July 12th contains more than $500 million in total funding for the public libraries. Now the library fine proposal was put on hold due to its complexity, but overall just a bang up budget. Uh, next slide, Paul. Can we go there, Christina and Mike? Let me suggest yes. a couple of things here. Let's do some quick catch up and we can order for our last 10 minutes here. One is, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the underlying theme that Mike and Christina have just hit, which is when you're working as an advocate at the legislative level, it's not all about just making the phone call and being done with it. It's the long-term relationship that Christina has just described that led to that $1 billion library infrastructure project. So if you're in this, think about being in it for the long haul. And if you are taking short-term things and focus on those issues where you could be most effective, but understand the more you're at it and the more you build those relationships, the better you're going to be. Circling back to a second thing here in terms of the um, putting forth of the CLA priorities, uh, Mary observed that actually the timeline we have is too late to work into the local platform there in Placer County to discuss with their lobbyists, which is going to be in the first week of November. Christina and Mike, any guidance you can give them, given that CLA has that thing that doesn't match up with theirs in terms of being most up to date, contacts they might make um, within CLA? I think the only thing that I would suggest, Paul, is that um, in the case of, of Mary's situation, she could just wait until she saw um, a news from the Capitol alert from us that said, you know, we need support on, uh, you know, say a library bond measure or uh, 
you know, 55% measure. And then she could take that to her uh, county board of supervisors or her city council and ask them to pass a resolution, which is commonly done. And then that resolution is then forwarded to the legislature. And so if that comes in in like May, or excuse me, March and April, when we're doing legislation, that's got a lot of weight to it. Um, because it's an official document from the city or county. So I think that's the way really to do it. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, just look for information after the first of the year about day in the district. Great, thank you. And again, a, a timing thing here. We've got about eight minutes left. I'm going to suggest, first of all, let me make a, a quick caveat here to those of you that are watching this. If you're the kind of audience member who wants to see every slide that we presented, please understand we put decks together so that we have our talking points. But we we obviously feel that it's more important to do what we've been doing, getting the Q&A going and answering the things that are most effective to you. What we have in part three is uh, a really great summary of that billion dollar library infrastructure project. What I'd like to suggest if Mike and Christina are okay with this is let's say you all will have access to the deck. So look at the deck that has those slides that really go into the details of the $1 billion as a resource. And if that interests you, go back to it. I suspect probably in our last seven or eight minutes, we could focus on two or three things under Mike and Christina's guidance. What I can do is just flip real fast through these. And you can stop me if there's something that makes sense. Does that work for you, Mike and Christina? Yeah. Paul, I think that's great. And I think, um, as you say, we'll just leave those slides there highlighting all of the victories this year. Some of that's gone out in our news from the Capitals. And if you want to jump right to outreach to legislators, uh, we can uh, start talking really quickly about some of those tools that we suggest for how to build those relationships. Okay, stop me when we get there. I'm right there. Good. There we go. Thank okay, you. well, I think, you know, just very quickly, what we'd like to say is please do not think that legislators are some sort of mythical creatures that, um, you know, you are not supposed to engage with. They put their pant leg on one leg at a time, just like you do. So they are your representatives in Sacramento, and it is your right to be able to outreach with them and build those relationships. They're your dentist. Uh, they're a, a small business owner. They may have sat on a city council or a school board, but they're people just like you. So please, please, please keep that in mind. You know, sometimes people think that they're um, you know, special or wouldn't want to hear from me. And that's just absolutely not the case. How about next slide, Paul? The most uh, important thing, if Mike and I can impart to you today, that uh, we'd like you to take away is that please establish those relationships with legislators before you need to ask them for something, some favor. It's like if somebody were to come into your library and sort of say, um, listen, I'd like you to do this and you do this for me. You, you'd be a little put off. It's kind of like, hello, and you are. So go ahead and craft that relationship first before you have to ask them for something. And Mike and I always try to do that. Legislative turnover doesn't always make that really easy for us, but that's always the optimum goal. Now, uh, what could you do a, a really easy one the easiest one is to make sure that your legislator is placed on your library's mailing list. And uh, that could be the library's mailing list or the mailing list for the friends and foundation group. Let them know the great services that you're providing. So many of the legislators come from past local elected official experience. So they do have some familiarity with the programs that you provide, but we can't tell you how many people say to us dumb stuff like, well, everything's online now. Why do we need libraries? Or, oh, we have Barnes and Noble. Why do we need libraries? I mean, hello. So please put your legislator on, their, on your mailing list. Um, Mike and I are constantly blown away by the fabulous programs that you have created. It's just awesome stuff. So that's a really easy one. How about the next slide? Uh, we've talked a little bit about Day in the District uh, as a reference. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what it is. It was designed to encourage library directors, staff, and supporters to request a meeting with the legislators in their district. If you've ever come up to Sacramento for a lobby day, you know they can be quite busy, quite crowded. Sometimes you don't get that time with the legislator that you would hope to get. Well, if you schedule a meeting with them in their district office, you are going to sit down with that legislator and likely for 20 to 25 minutes. And it's gonna be a really quality uh, conversation where you can get into the weeds about some of your library issues. 
Right now, some of these meetings are being done virtually, but it won't always be that way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, program in just a second, but uh, people who participate in it absolutely love this advocacy tool. Uh, next slide. The other way that you can get involved, of course, is to send a, a le letter to a legislator when you see one of the alerts uh, that Mike and I send out. Uh, we always try to give you some talking points um, that you can use in your letter. And now that you know how to look up a bill, that could also be very helpful to you. We would request that you try to customize it a little bit. There's nothing... Um, we don't make that impact when we get 30 of the same letters. Legislators just go, oh, I see this is the same, same thing over and over again. So say it's a bill that would help um, libraries build more uh, uh, libraries and with 55% bond, et cetera. You might explain your library's built in 1940, it's in disrepair, needs completely new wiring, and you don't have enough room for the children to sit for story time. Um, your letter should always be very respectful. Uh, take that tone always. It will backfire if you do anything uh, less than that. And if a letter is nicely written and on letterhead, it's very likely that you could receive a call from a legislator's office who says, hey, my boss is going to vote on this bill in about a week. And we saw your story about the library built in 1940. Now, that's pretty stunning. And we're guessing that's a library in pretty bad disrepair. My boss would like to say a few things about that during committee. Do you mind if you and I have a little chat about that? So that is dynamic advocacy. Uh, next slide, Paul. Now, another way to get them involved, uh, legislators involved, is to invite them to your library to read to children during uh, National Library Week. This creates a, an awesome photo opportunity for both you uh, the library, and then the legislator themselves. And please, please, please post it to social media because they love it. It's a great way to make a friend. And again, we're trying to make friends first before we need to go ask them for something. Um, some library directors, as been mentioned, also attend city council or board of supervisors meetings, and they can be active on that level as well. That's not necessarily affecting Sacramento advocacy, but it uh, shows support for the libraries in your area. Next slide. Um, Mike and I want to expand just a little bit quickly on how to best structure a meeting in the district with a legislator. We can't stress enough how important pre-planning is. Pre-planning is going to make sure that the meeting goes smoothly, everybody can play a role, determine who's going to take each part, um, who's going to do the introductions, who's going to do the messaging, Who's going to do the ask at the end? And Paul, am I okay on, on the session or do you In terms talking of talking for a few more minutes? Go about another minute or two. We'll okay. do a wrap up here. And again, for those okay. of you that want more uh, background, there are a few more things in the slides that will be helpful to you if you want to come back to it. You got it. I try to keep these meetings to five to six people via Zoom maybe and about seven to eight uh, people in person. Um, that's a good manageable group. And of course, you're going to forward all of your information to the scheduler ahead of time, including the fact sheets, but do not assume that your legislator is going to have time to read the fact sheets before you sit down with him or her. So you're going to want to start with from scratch when you sit down. You're going to say, Senator, I'm wondering, are you familiar with the Lunch at the Library program? Let us tell you a little bit about it and then paint them a picture. How many students come in and sit for lunch at the library? Are parents allowed? Do the parents use wraparound social services when they're there at the library? What could you do with more money? How many more kids could you serve if you had a little bit more money? And then again, the ask at the end, designate somebody who will say, thank you, Senator, so much for your time. You know, as you've heard, this is a program with a lot of pressure on it, a lot of students needing meals during the summer. And if we were to have more money for this program, uh, we could sure do a lot and serve a lot more children. And we hope that you will support a budget ask 
uh, when uh, CLA forwards this to the legislature this year. And at so, this, yes. At this point, let's remind people there are a few more tips in there and some wrap up tips. But there's a question I want to make sure we don't miss before uh, we wrap this up. The question is Is there a list of legislators that are influential to library issues, like chairs of key committees, et cetera? That's a fabulous question. Usually, what Mike and I will do when we see where either a bill is headed, so say we knew this bill, SB 34, was going to the Senate Education Committee we will provide a list of all of those folks either in our news from the Capitol update when we ask you to weigh in on the bill or if it's during budget season and we, we have some folks that sit on budget subcommittee, they're the chairs of budget committee, et cetera, we'll put together a key contacts list and we'll put that on the advocacy page uh, where you might find your day in the district tools and the CLA platform, and you'll have all of those tools. And we may even reach out to you if you are in a legislator's district um, who sits on one of those subcommittees. We might say to the folks in Monterey, hey, you're pretty important this year. You're in Senator John Laird's district, and he's the chair of the Senate Budget Subcommittee. So um, you might be engaged that way as well. So yes, we'll put all of those tools after the first of the year, maybe around end of February, first part of March for people that are uh, heading out the door for day in the district. And that's all I have, Paul. We know that there's some selected resources we want to put up. We know that some of you have to run off to your next meeting. So we will wrap this within the next minute. If you have other questions, put them into the chat, please. Remember that the series that we're doing here continues into November and December. It'll always be the second, always those last two months, It'll be the second Wednesday of the month. The next two sessions will be two hour sessions. In November, it's Patrick Sweeney from Every Library talking about uh, what you can do as a grassroots advocate out there and what Every Library has been doing to set examples. In December, we've got some good surprises that are in the works for you. The series will probably continue into next year in, a, in an updated version, but we wanna see these first four sessions flow out and see how they're working for you and fine tune them as we go. So last minute questions for Christina or for Mike. And Susan is asking about the charges there. There is a charge for the November and December sessions. Mm -hmm. It's listed on the calendar listing of the CLA page. Off the top of my head, I believe we're charging $25 for members, $35 for non-members, and there's a reduced fee for students. Again, we're gearing this toward California advocates, California members of the library community, and we hope that you join us. Mary's commenting so great, thank you. Way better than, ooh, way better than my poli sci courses at Chico a million years ago. <laughs> yes, yes for us and for poli sci. Crystal saying that was very informative. Appreciate the practical, actionable takeaways. Mike and Christina, one line wrap up that you wanna leave people with to, to get them thinking in terms of what their next steps are. Since Christina has been uh, covering quite a bit, I would just add, get to know your legislator uh, they think very highly of libraries. Years ago, uh, one of the big libraries in Los Angeles invited an assemblyman down who had been very helpful with some funding. They actually made a bookmark that said, thank you, assembly member, for all the work you do on behalf of libraries. So things like that are just huge. Christina? Oh, boy, Paul, I, I would say that we've never encountered a legislator who says, boy, I really don't like my library. Everybody loves libraries. So please don't be intimidated to reach out to them at any time and just introduce yourself. Thank you. Our last challenge to all of you on this, um, we won't hang on to the recording very much for this, but if you want to stay for one or two more minutes, the action question is, what will you do differently in the next week or two? as a result of having participated in the session. And those of you who are watching the archive version, same question. This is your way to take this from being something where you stepped away from work, now you go back to work, to actually incorporating it into your work. So that, that million dollar question, as we wrap it up, and as we invite you to stay with us beyond the recording, if you have any other questions, what will you do in the next couple of weeks as a result of having been here? Thank you so much for staying with us. We'll end the recording when you see that go off. Uh, obviously, you don't need our permission to be dismissed, but we'll see you again soon. And those of you that want to stay, we'll stay a few more minutes. So thanks a lot. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.